Howdy there, folks. I hope everybody's doing tremendous. We're a little early today. Hello, hello. Yeah, only the real ones are here. That's right. That's right. We're looking at what's kind of going on in the market today, which very intriguing day, folks. Very intriguing day. Uh, Russell, the Russell Wilson coming to life. Who would have ever thought it? What a strange occurrence. The Russell never does anything for like the past freaking two years. Literally, the Russell hasn't done anything for like Two years, probably over two years, honestly. Uh, let's check out good old Russell Wilson here. So let's pull up a five-year Russell Wilson. So obviously we're down massively from where we were at back in. <laughs> shoot, we're down massively from where we were back in 2020 even. If you look at December 2020, the Russell's considerably lower today than it was back in December 2020. See where it was October 2020. Uh, we were right there, October. So basically, we're barely higher on the Russell three years later right now, which just kind of shows you literally how uh, the Russell has done nothing, nothing for years. So, so if you look today, I mean, it's really these small little little guys are rolling today. Look at Avant. Avant's up 12% here today. Fubo's up 7%. Uh, Target, the beaten down dog it is, is finally having a decent day. JWN's finally having a decent day. Uh, Shopify is having a good three day, 3%. Look at Cake today, three or excuse me, um, Honest, 3%. Uh, Cake today, about 2.8%. So you're really getting a lot of the performance from a lot of the small caps, honestly, for the first time in a long time. Like, you know, which you have to ask yourself, are we going into a situation where maybe this market is ready to go risk on? I don't know. You can't really run to enough, uh, how do I put it? You can't make a judgment on where the market's headed based upon one day of tra trading action, right? But if this is something we see continually for the next several days, if not next couple weeks, uh, clearly the market's ready to go much more risk on, right? If you see small caps outperform and outperform and outperform, and you see a lot of these risky small caps starting to roll, then you know you might actually be going into a real bull market, and not just a um. Because well, you know what's everybody said about this market the whole damn year? Oh, it's just the biggest cap market cap companies, biggest techs, you know, Metas and the Teslas and the Shopify's and all those stocks that have been climbing. And I mean, to be quite frank, they've been they've been right, right? They, they've been they've been accurate. That, that's just all it has been. Oh, PayPal, you never go up. PayPal, you're always down. Um, Planet was the only small that's not really rolling today. Strange. All right, let's pull up Big Tech. Hmm. Yeah, I mean, not the most exciting day for Big Tech. You have uh, obviously significant underperformance for Netflix here today. We'll have to check Netflix, see what's going on. It's kind of a strange move. It almost feels like there must be something wrong with Netflix in, in terms of like something bad news came out or downgrade or something, you know, because it's weird that it would be down over 2% on a nice green day like it is today. Other than that, not too much happening. Oracle ha does have my interest a little bit. This question is, do I want to buy a company like that that has a really, really bad uh, balance sheet? Commodities, Oatly, or excuse me, Oatly, uh, Oats are down quite a bit today. Wheat's down quite a bit. That's good to see. WTI down a little bit. That's good to see. You know, if we can have a green day in the market and WTI down, I like that. I like that a lot. I'll be honest with you guys. Um, housing industry surges, or excuse me, urges power to stop raising rates or risk an economic hard landing. Hey, there we go. The pushback is starting, for folks. The pushback is starting. It is. The National Association of Home Builders, the Mortgage Bankers Association, and the National Association of Real... Wait, did I do it? And National Association of Realtors wrote to the Fed to convey profound concern about the industry. The group asked the Fed not to contemplate further rate hikes and not to uh, actively sell its holdings of mortgage securities. Interesting. The begging has started, folks. That means, that means these folks are starting to get very worried. 
Top real estate and banking officials are calling on the Federal Reserve to stop raising interest rates as the industry suffers through surging housing costs and a historic shortage of available homes. In a letter Monday addressed to the Federal Bo uh, Fed Board of Governors and Chair Jerome Powell, the officials voiced their worries about the direction of monetary policy and the impact it's having on the beleaguered uh, real estate market. National Association of Home Builders, the Mortgage Bankers Association, and the National Association of Realtors said that they wrote the letter, quote, to convey profound concern shared among our collective memberships that ongoing market uncertainty about the Fed's rate path is contributing to recent interest rate hikes and volatility. Interesting. They don't want the Fed to raise anymore. I urge the Fed to take these simple steps to ensure that the sectors does not um, precipitate the hard landing the Fed has tried to avoid. So basically all I'm trying to see now is are they asking for the Fed to lower rates? And it doesn't look like it. And, and the reason I think that's important is the reason I think that's important uh, to see if they're asking a lower rates or not because then you know how severe things are really getting uh, in the housing market or not, right? Because it's one thing to say, please don't raise anymore, please don't raise anymore. It's another to say, please cut, please cut. When you get to the please cut phase, it's, it's complete game over. You're, you know, you're in a bad place if you're already you know, writing letters to the Fed to beg them to not raise rates anymore. The next step is you start begging them to start lowering rates. And that's a whole different situation there. So... Amazon having a decent day. Okay, let's see little Fubo here. What's going on? Five straight days. And as for tech, today the NASDAQ 100 getting back above its 50-day moving average on an intraday basis. Alphabet hitting a new high today, and some of that coming with that lower rate move as well. Take a look at the picture in yields, because just about everywhere you look on the curve today, they are falling. There's red across the board showing that story well. Takes us to our talk of the tape. How much room is there for stocks to make a run into year end? Let's ask Lauren Goodwin of New York Life Investments here at Post Night. Nice to see you. I mean, that's what some people are talking about, that we're set up, we're setting up for a run into the end of the year. Do you buy it or no? I think that we'll see some upside in equity towards the end of the year, but the challenge for investors is that when you're in this late cycle environment where market narratives are shifting back and forth, it's difficult to get meaningful sector or even style performance for more than a couple of days at a time. And so I expect that we'll continue to see, frankly, what we've been seeing over the past few weeks, which is a range bound and volatile market, but one in which you have to stay invested because we have not reached a recession or a bear market yet. What if rates continue to move lower? I mean, that's what this is largely about, right? This rate relief, if you want to call it that, yields coming down and stocks going up. Well, if rates continue to move lower, I think that will be the primary driver of a, of a reasonable rebound in the equity market. Mm -hmm. What I'm looking for to determine whether that's viable are a couple of things. First, of course, what we're hearing out of the Fed is important. Of course, the CPI data that we're going to get this Thursday are important. Right. But when it comes to market-driven rates, it's also about supply and demand dynamics. These past couple of days, we've had a little bit of relief from Fed narratives and, a, and also a little bit of risk-mitigating type of buying. Mm -hmm. But Treasury supply is still over overwhelming we expect it to remain that way and so the term premium aspect of long-term treasury yields mm -hmm. very much at play so did you say whether it's viable or buyable because you could look at it both ways right <laughs> and i was like hmm, which one did i hear because i, I hear you saying okay well, viable is it really lasting is it gonna you know are they coming down and, and gonna stay down because of all the issues that everybody's been talking about supply who the buyers are or is it buyable if you believe that rates are going to continue to go down therefore you should play for a year-end move in well, stocks when it Okay, so when it comes to buying into duration, which we're hearing a lot of institutional investors eager to do at yields where they've been, especially in the 10 year and further out in the mm -hmm, curve, mm -hmm. I'm hesitant to make aggressive moves in duration because when rates are moving around because of the term premium, as opposed to meaningful changes in inflation or rates expectations, that leads to more volatile long end of the curve. And so I, it, it's just not my favorite place to add risk early, but when it comes to the equity market, I do expect that it, it can be a boon on a, a given day like today. I mean, you know, look, Fed speakers have been coming out almost one after the other, and I, I mentioned at the top of our show in about 27 minutes or so, we expect remarks from Minneapolis Fed Prez Neil Kashkari. We'll have the highlights of that. But one after the other, 
They're coming out and looking at the action in the bond market over the last month and saying, you know what, financial conditions have tightened considerably. We may not have to do anything else. What does that mean? The tricky thing is with that line of, of discourse is that by saying that, financial conditions today have eased. Right. And so you're, you're well, putting, slightly, I slightly. Mean, they, they were up a lot in, in, in September rates, but relative to where monetary and bank lending conditions are, financial conditions are still relatively sanguine. And so I think what the Fed is 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 dealing with is an environment where the data. Ha All right. So what I pulled up here, this is obviously extremely important for what's going on in the market, uh, specifically here today. I mean, look at it across the board. Treasuries are down every Freaking treasuries down today, right? And that is seen as one, the market wants to see treasuries go down. The, the market wants to see basically treasuries have peaked. If they believe treasuries have peaked, then certainly it's it's bullish times for stocks, right? And it's, that's pretty much the playbook this year. Treasuries up, stocks down, treasuries down, stocks up, um, especially over the past several months. So now it, it is even viewed in a, in a, a greater extent of mattering for small caps like for small caps specifically right um treasuries down that's like really really good for small caps treasuries up really really bad for small caps and so i think that's why you're seeing a lot of this what i would call strange activity in regards to a lot of these smalls today where they're having these huge monumental days right like avant 12 percent moves is massive um you know fubo nearly seven percent move uh, you know, even Honest is having a really good day. So some of those like smaller cap companies, Revolve certainly fits a smaller cap company. Uh, you know, that's having a good day today. So I think, uh, you know, something to be said there in regards to what's going on with treasuries there today. Let's see. I'm going to pull up a one day at a Dow. So I'm guessing this must have been around the time Biden's speech on the war was. Somebody was asking about that earlier. And I'm guessing that brought down the market a little bit, but it's not really the day for the Dow. It's really the day for small caps. That's who's shining today. This is not the day of the big dogs. This is the day of the small guys, right? That's why the Russell's making the move it's made. And look at how stable the Russell's been. And look at that. I mean, that baby's up in a straight line. You're going to be flipping my flapjacks, folks. Um, that that's, that's not even humans doing that. I can tell you, that's not even humans. That's freaking the machines. It's AI. It's, uh, you know, simple. Treasury's down, Russell up. Yo. That's, that's, not human. that's not human activity there. That Russell shot to the moon right from basically the jump of the market and, and over that next 30 minutes to an hour. So, Estee Lauder down. Yes. I need EL down, baby. I, that is one I'm looking at. Uh, let's just call it with a lot of interest, with a lot of interest, looking at EL. So, so, but you can see how much of a risk on day it is, right? Because look at, look at another stock that's having a great day. Rivian, Rivian up 5% today. Why is Rivian up 5%? It's only going to be up that much if, uh, you know, you're really risk on. Invert. It's done with a bull steepener because of the short end starting to reflect the likelihood of the Fed cutting. And I just don't think that's in the near term calculus right now. You know, the other thing I, I want to discuss since we're talking about recession, Lauren, is the idea of sectors that get hit to Lizanne's point, you know, hit first in this rolling move. Well, small caps were crushed. And now they've been coming back a bit, going for five up days in a row. Wall Street Journal with an article today suggesting that they're screaming recession, but that they can soar right here. Almost time to buy them. Is now the time? Has the time come to buy small caps? Small caps can outperform when the economic picture is improving. And I don't think that's what we get first. Certainly from a valuations perspective, there's a lot of, of sort of energy and impetus to buy small caps. But the macro case, really, I, I... So I don't think people are taking into account enough. Everybody's on the assumption that things are only going to get worse as far as the economy goes. They're, they're convinced, right? And that's pretty prevalent across Wall Street. I don't want to say every single person because I'm sure you got the Tom Lees of the world that probably feel, uh, you know, bullish. But I can tell you most of these folks feel like the economy is going to get worse in 24 than it was in 23, and it's a potential, right? As all things are potentials in the market. 
but you also need to take into account situations you haven't. We have just turned a corner in terms of real wages. Now, if real wages continue to go up, what does that mean ultimately for uh, the economy? Well, that's going to be a great thing. Real wages went down for like two years straight. If we can have inflation be, let's call it not a problem next year, right? Or let's call it a very minor problem next year, talking about 2024, we have the employment market stay good and we have real wages get in a better place. That's extremely bullish for the economy actually, right? Now, if you could talk about at some point, maybe the Fed lowers rates a little bit, then that could ease up uh, on, on lending, which could start to benefit a little bit, at least maybe the housing market or something like that. So I don't know. I just don't think enough people are taking into account the range of possibilities we have truly for 2024. And I mean, there's a range of possibilities. And this is why I personally, personally, remain hedged in this market, right? I'm hedged for 2024. I'll do a little bit more hedging over this next 30 to 60 days. Make sure I'm hedged for next year. In case the stuff hits a fan and the economy gets bad, I'm hedged, right? And on the flip side, if that's not the situation and we're looking good, then uh, then obviously I'm gonna make a lot of money because you know I have so much invested. So, all right, do you guys believe in a year-end rally for stocks? I'd love to hear your guys' opinion in the chat. And then I'll share my opinion in just a moment. SunPower, SunRun, and SunNova, among some of the biggest gainers, if we can show you here. One of the ETFs that tracks that group, ticker TAN, it's also having its best day since last November. But it's still down around 10% in the past month as growth-oriented sectors have come under pressure. And Block is firmly higher as Bank of America reiterates its buy rating. Analysts say its recent pullback is unjustified. Wow. And shares are too cheap relative to the company's fundamentals. The firm has a $71 price target on the stock, currently trading, as you can see, here just under $46 a share. Scott, back over to you. All right, Court, we'll see you in just a bit. Courtney Reagan, breaking news now out of the Sam Bankman Freed trial. Kate Rooney here with that from outside the courthouse. Kate, what do we know now? Hey, Scott, so Carolyn Ellison is on the witness stand. We just got some news involving another crypto company, Binance. Ellison saying that in order to buy back a stake in FTX that Binance owned, executives used a billion dollars worth of customer funds. They say this was to buy out Binance's CEO, also known as CZ, Cheng Peng Zhao, a big competitor to FTX at the time, Sam Bankman-Fried, told Ellison, she said, to borrow from FTX for the buyout because we, quote, have to get it done. That entire stake was worth about $2 billion. She also went on to say that she started working for SBF back in 2018 and after being hired found out that Alameda, the hedge fund that he also controls, was in much worse financial uh, shape than she thought. It had suffered some large losses. She described lenders pulling out and said that more, of, more than half of the staff had quit. The prosecution really came out swinging today. She was the CEO of this hedge fund, the Sam Bankman Freed majority owned she said they asked if they she committed financial crimes when running that hedge fund she said without hesitation yes and said quote sam directed me to commit these crimes we're getting more we're in a slight break right now scott heading back into the courtroom but we'll keep you posted as this all plays out all right i know you will kate rooney thank you so much appreciate that we're just getting started here on closing what? bell up next searching for our sam directed me to uh, make these moves it's like being a gangster and shooting somebody and being like, oh, the big boss, he told me to do it. So it was not my fault. Like, what? Y'all, that's crazy situation, man. Like, what are we talking about there? Okay, um, so in terms of people being bullish for year end, uh, are you guys bullish for year end? Uh, somebody says, I'm going yes. Uh, somebody says, volatile, that's for sure. So, yeah, and in terms of myself personally, am I bullish on, on year end? If we can get treasuries to stop going up, then yes, I am bullish uh, for year end. Um, but I do have a little concerns. I mean, if we got more and more bonds hitting the market, there's a potential treasuries haven't actually peaked yet. Although I really hope they have peaked. I hope treasuries have peaked. There's a potential they haven't. And if that's the situation, obviously, it's very hard to be bullish on the stocks in the year end. Um, but... Regardless, I am bullish on 2024 for dividend and value stocks. I do believe there's going to be definitely a lot of money kind of moving into those guys. Um, you know, we'll, we'll see what happens. So, uh, what's going on here? Teens are buying iPhones near record levels, but uh, but Apple Watch interest has slipped. What? 
Are the teens really like super excited about the new iPhones? Investment firm Piper Sandler is out with research latest to his health and buying trends in America's teenagers. And the firm noted that a picture for Apple hardware is a bit more mixed uh, than in the past. According to the survey, which questioned 9,193 teenagers, that's a very specific number, with an average age of 15.7 uh, years old across 49 states and captured more than 2.4 million data points uh, across the buying patterns and in industry ownership of Apple's iPhone is still near record levels 87% assuming we purchase intent is still high 88% okay um, I don't know this made it sound at first like they're all going to buy the newest iPhone 15 or something conversely cash app was the most used app for peer-to-peer -peer money transfer, followed by PayPal's Venmo at 36%. Okay, so maybe it's the younger generation that uses Cash App, because I don't know anybody that freaking uses Cash App. Anybody. Um, everybody I know uses Venmo, or they use PayPal, or they use, um, a few use Apple Pay. So, I don't know anybody that uses Cash App, and they always see it like number one in the App Store, and I'm like, who the hell is using Cash App? So, let me know what you guys usually use if you have to, like, if you go to lunch with somebody and you got to transfer them $20, right, and you don't have the cash on you, what are you using? Are you using PayPal, Venmo, Cash App, Apple Pay, Google Pay, or something else? I would love to see what you guys are using because Cash App is, like, the thing I don't know freaking anybody that uses it. But, like, you know, I'm 33. Most of the people I know are in their 30s, 40s, or, you know, uh, and whatnot. So, I don't know. Maybe it's just a different demo. Uh, Nasdaq SP Dow March hires Treasury yield slide. Yes, Fed comment. Oh, what the f some Fed officials were talking, or as Mav would say, Fed zombies. Let's see uh, what they said. Uh, the muted currency market response suggests that it may be more about Fed expectations. Member of the Fed are jostling one another for media spotlight today. Donovan added. Earlier, Atlanta Fed President Rafael Bostic, Mr. Bostic, at a forum said that the central bank's policy rate was at a sufficiently restrictive level to get inflation down to its 2% goal. Other speaker, speakers scheduled to appear later today at various events include federal government Christopher Waller, Minneapolis Fed President Neil Kashkare, and Saint, uh, San Francisco Fed President Mary Daly. I, it bothers me that I know who all these freaking Fed presidents are now. Like, I never used to know who the Fed presidents were. Now I freaking know them all. And it just makes me frustrated because that just shows, like, how much power the Fed has really taken over in the market over the past just few years. I never knew. The only person I knew was, a, uh, you know, the speaker, uh, the Fed president. That was it, the big dog, okay? It was Janet Yellen. Um, back when I first got in the market, it was Ben Bernanke, Right? Um, recently, obviously, it's Jerome Powell, but I never knew all these other ones. Now I freaking know them all, and it's just because they have so much power, they get talked about so much, that they been they all are on my radar, and I'm just like, ah, it just shows like how much they've really taken over power of this market now, right? So, positive Fed speak allowed the markets to end higher on Monday after comments from the Dallas Fed President, Lori Logan, Fed Vice Chair for Supervision, Michael Baer, and Fed Vice President, uh, Philip Jefferson. The remarks helped market participants outlook uh, the potential ramifications. By the way, thank you everybody that follows. So it's important everybody understands the three most probable situations for uh, the economy in, uh, you know, we can call it 20, uh, 2024, okay? So one scenario that could play out in 2024 is uh, Fed keeps rates higher for longer. Obviously it devastates the economy. It causes, uh, let's call it a lot of job losses, huge weakness in the economy. Fed has to eventually revert by the end of the year, start cutting rates because the economy's in trouble, recession, 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 okay? That's one potential. Second potential is the economy stays too hot, let's say for instance, job stays too strong, you have more strikes um, at these workplaces, you have more employees asking for bigger and bigger wages, it creates a, a wage price spiral, uh, it caused the Fed to have to continue to even raise rates in 2024, which really no one's anticipating. It ends up leading to stagflation in a major way, and you have a mess there, okay? That's the second scenario. The third scenario that is a, you know, in one of these three scenarios is likely going to play out. And the third scenario is 
Jobs market stays good. So meaning we keep unemployment under 4%. We're in the threes, right? Uh, we have a scenario in which, by the way, thank you everybody that follows and subscribes on here. We have a situation where real wages continue to tick up as the year goes along. Inflation's not a problem. Consumers start to feel a lot better about the state of the economy. Consumer confidence improves to historic levels um, versus these very poor levels it's really been at for the last like two years or so. Small business confidence increases because they're stop having to deal with the crazy amount of inflation that they had dealt with in 2022 and 2023 and some businesses even 2021. Uh, you know, if no one was, it, inflation wasn't really on a lot of people's radars in 2021, but believe me, if you ran a small business, you were already starting to feel the effects of inflation in 2021. I spoke to so many people that own small businesses, small businesses, meaning businesses that let's call it less than a million dollar businesses. Okay. Uh, maybe they make a hundred, 200, 300 grand a year. These people were feeling inflation in 2021. Okay. And much of that is gone for these small businesses now. So it's still a popular subject in the media, but I just tell you like a lot of these small business folks I speak to, like inflation's not their biggest worry or what's going on now. Like it's still a concern, it's still something to pay attention to, but it's not like it was certainly a year ago or even two years ago for that matter, right? So that's the third scenario and things get better and better. Uh, you know, shopping and, and spending at retail, restaurants continues and, and if anything strengthens next year. So those are three scenarios. It's important that we understand all three scenarios because too many people are getting into this mindset of only believing one of those scenarios is going to play out, right? And just only looking at it from that perspective. And I'm like, there's, there's several different things that could happen for us in 2024. And uh, the truth is no one knows which of those three are really going to play out. We'll obviously see which one of those three plays out, but I can almost guarantee you it's going to be one of those three that I just went through there uh in this video here today folks okay so um do earnings dictate stock price in a bad recession or bear market uh slightly but not that much if you're you know and of course this depends upon what type of recession you're really dealing with uh what type of potential crash or whatever you're dealing with in the market i mean if you look back to the great financial crisis I mean, earnings were uh, not as important, let's just call it that. Uh, it, it was just very fearful, right? And uh, there was a lot of liquidity drying up. There was a lot of assets having to be sold at very poor prices, which causes more assets to be sold. You had investment banking problems in a substantial way. Um, a lot of these investment banks, certainly back in the day and even to today, hold a lot of securities. Uh, which causes like almost like margin call situations for a lot of the investment banks. And you just got one domino hits another, hits another. And uh, you had valuations that went down, you know, by the, by the first quarter of 20, uh, 2009. I mean, you know, valuations were among the most ch cheap you had seen in, in, you know, certainly decades in regards to stocks. And so, but once again, if you get just a little more of a minor recession, you know, it might be a little more focused on, on, earnings, but some comes down to also what are interest rates at that point in the market. If interest rates are like zero or 1% or 2% or something very, very low, let's say for instance, well, naturally stocks are going to command a bigger valuation in that situation, right? If on the flip side, you're dealing with uh, interest rates of five or 6%, then stocks will certainly command a lower valuation in that market, right? So that's just something to kind of keep in mind there. Um, somebody asked me about AAP stock. Yeah, we spoke about that the other day. I just wasn't too sure. Advanced Auto Parts, uh, you know, it seemed like they've been getting their lunch eaten by AutoZone a little bit. So, yeah, I did, didn't really have a strong opinion. Hey, Jeremy, what do you think about CCL, another beaten down dividend stock? I don't know. I've been very interested in CCL recently. I haven't bought it, but very uh, interested because, you know, CCL... You know, and that was a stock obviously I owned back in the day, and unfortunately then Rona came and uh, screwed them royally. <laughs> Let's just call it that. But uh, the thing that's good for CCL is if people are in a tighter financial situation and they still want to go on vacation, like those cruises are so freaking cheap. Like the literally the cruises are one of the most, you know, one of the most affordable things you can do as far as like getting a vacation. Um, and also a lot of older folks love cruises. They love cruises. A lot of people 50 plus love cruises. So you get a good mix of like people that want to take their kids on cruises, right? And it's 
pretty dang cheap compared to a lot of vacations. And, uh, you know, food's included and all those sorts of things. And then drinks as well, unless you get alcohol, then it's like a little upsell type thing, right? But so you get the families that want to go. You get the, just a massive amount of retirees and people 50s, 60s, 70s that like to go on those cruises, man. And so, you know, with the baby boomer generation, a lot of them retiring over this next, we can call it, decade, 10 to 15 years. Like most of baby boomer generation is going to be retiring in this next 10 to 15 years. Uh, and a lot of them are going to have good amounts of money. And so a lot of them will be taking cruises. And of course, cruises are, the you know, even if you look at something like a CCL, they've got very high end cruises because they don't just own the Carnival brand. They own other brands as well. So they have some of these very high end cruises. So the people that have more money or whatever, like let's say you're a baby boomer, you're, you're 65, you're retired, you want to go on this baller cruise and spend like $10,000. Carnival's got those type of cruises for you as well, right? Um, even like month long cruises which I can't imagine going on a cruise for a month, but a lot of retirees like to go on those month-long cruises. And on the flip day, on the flip side, you want to take your kids on a, you know, relatively cheap vacation. You can, you know, take out of Long Beach on a Carnival cruise ship for maybe, you know, a few hundred bucks a person, all the drinks and food included. And, uh, you know, sail down to Ensenada, Mexico, something like that for three, four days, and then you're back. So, uh, you know, they really kind of hit all the different price points and things like that. So... Uh, let's see how things are trading here. Kind of getting close to the close of the market. About 20 minutes or so left. Vaughn's still making a big move. Vanilla and one's pushing 14% move. Holy smokes. Uh, Fubo having a pretty good afternoon, certainly, right? Uh, Target is coming back to life. Cake. You know, you've seen a little bit of risk on in the dividend stocks. Why are you seeing dividend stocks move up today? Think about that for a moment. Why are you seeing dividend stocks? I'll tell you exactly why you're seeing dividend stocks move up. Look at treasuries. Treasury is down across the board. Treasury is down across the board. Good for dividend stocks. Um, those ones have been slaughtered because the, the, the thought process is, well, shit, if treasuries keep going up, uh, why are you going to put money in dividend stocks when you could have that money in um, you know, treasuries earning you 5%, if not over 5%. That's the way a lot of people view it, right? So just something to kind of keep, keep in mind there. Uh, do you have any recommendations to grow my portfolio short term so I can make... Uh, long-term investments no like the more you get caught up into like trying to get focused on trying to make some short-term money in the market the more you're going to get into more like gambling decisions the more you're going to end up in problems that's just what i'm going to say like chasing the money short term is just not worth it like uh you know at the end of the day like it's best just to get a second job or get some side income get a side hustle going something like that uh because, yeah, if you start looking like, oh, man, I want to make some money short term so I can plug in the stocks long term. It's just, you know, you, the whole mentality is just flawed and you get into a lot of problems just time and time again, unfortunately. So you know, somebody said they appreciate the content. Appreciate you being here. Uh, somebody says their dad's going on their third. I'm assume, assuming they're going on their third cruise. So that's cool. And somebody says, let me pitch you WBD. Okay. Huge debt. But the debt is fixed rate 4% with low refinancing, 14-year average. They have upcoming movies. Trending news. New highs in equities in market by mid-2024, says Stephen Parker, Peter Parker's brother. Uh, with an eye on the Middle East and specifically the oil markets, outlook for earnings in the equity market seems to reaccelerate, <clears throat> which could cause new highs by the middle of 2024. Hmm, interesting. Higher crude oil prices hurt earnings. Uh, and at the end of the day, that's what the market is going to respond to. But it's also going to hurt the consumer, she said. Hmm, interesting. Our view is that, uh, is that the earnings outlook looks good. We think we bottomed our last quarter. We began to reaccelerate. The fundamental story is a good one, which is supportive of stocks. As long as crude oil doesn't spike higher and stay higher, she said. Huh. We, uh, we know that a lot of the rally this year has been driven by the Magnificent Seven. Yes. We think that there's a catch-up trade more broadly across the market, so we're moving down the capitalization, uh, capitalization spectrum a little bit, not all the way down to small cap because higher rates have a bigger impact there. Yes, but if you feel rates have peaked, well, then you could be a little more bullish right on the small guys google could face ai backlash netflix getting into live sports wait what is this oh this is predictions and it can't be scaring me like that 
Netflix has seemed very content with not getting into live sports. Live sports is extremely expensive, and uh, Netflix just has not seemed interested to get in that uh, messy situation. But I want to hear what their prediction is here. Apple, by the end of this year, more than half of iPhones in use are expected to be secondhand devices. Pre-owned iPhones and hand-me-downs are expected to make up more than 50% of the 1.3 billion devices in use uh, by the end of 2023. Wow. Now, the second-hand market continues to take a larger uh, share of sales as the appetite for used devices grows and the circular economy extends the life devices. You know, also I think a lot of that comes down to is inflationary period we've been going through the last couple of years. Another part of that is just not as enough excitement in new devices that's making people like say, I got to go get the newest iPhone. Because they kind of view it and they're like, well, two years ago, iPhone seems about the same. You know, in people's minds, at least. So I think that's a lot of what it comes down to. Netflix. Next, Netflix has been reluctant to offer live sports because of concerns about high price and limited opportunities to such programming to large-scale audience. That hesitation is coming to an end, CCS uh, Insight predicted. Slowing consumer growth and competition from other streaming providers will force a company into live sports initially with a low-profile pro investment targeting its young and tech-savvy audience. The logical place to start would be baseball, golf, ice hockey, and motor sports given the popularity of U.S. viewers. The days of watching reruns of Lost are coming to an end. Yeah, the whole live sports thing, like Amazon bought out the rights for Thursday Night Football, for instance, right? They paid a lot for that. Let me see if I can find how much Amazon paid for those Thursday Night Football rights. They paid a lot. And I'll be honest, I don't think Amazon's really getting their money's worth, I guess we can say. Let's see. How much did... Amazon pay for Thursday Night Football. There it is. Oh my gosh. Amazon paid $11 billion to carry Thursday Night Football for 11 seasons, streaming it to Prime Video to entice more signups of membership. What? Wow. Oh my word. You gotta be flipping my flapjacks. That's a huge, huge number, folks. Massive. Whoo! 11 billion flipping flapjack numbers? A billion dollars? For 11 seasons. So basically, they're paying about a billion dollars a year for their rights to Thursday Night Football, which, what is there, 16, 17 games each year? Uh, Thursday Night Football. So. They're paying about, um, we can call it a little less than $100 million a game. What are they paying? Maybe $75 million a game, basically. Maybe $80 million a game for Thursday Night Football. What I found time and time again is most of Thursday Night Football games are trash. Like, such horrible matchups. You're like, someone would have to pay me to watch this team play this team. Like, really bad matchups. And, uh, I mean, damn. Like... That's a lot of money. And also keep in mind, like Amazon has to front all the cost of the production, right? Like uh, that's a lot of money. You have to pay the announcers. And, like, so Amazon spending, like you can say, well, if they're paying maybe $75 million or whatever, roughly a game to the NFL for the rights, but I can tell you it's costing them so much more than that. It's easily costing them a hundred, $200 million likely per game in total cost. So then you have to try to make up for that in advertising and trying to get people to go to Prime or whatever. But it's just like, I don't know, man. I feel like if somebody wants Prime, they're going to have Prime. You know what I mean? Like, I think regardless of the Thursday Night Football. So I just don't think Amazon's really gotten their money's worth. I don't know. Maybe maybe they will. Maybe they won't. I just don't think so. Um, I think maybe it was one of those things at the time. Maybe it sounded cool. But I, I, I don't know if the payoff's really been there. Uh, somebody said, any favorite dividend stock? I love them all, man. I'm buying so many different dividend stocks right now. I've been buying, I mean, what haven't I been buying in dividend land recently? I've been buying, uh, you know, like when I've been buying what Target, I've been buying, oh gosh, Cake, I've been buying Texas Roadhouse. I've been buying, man, there's just a lot of dividend stocks I love right now. So I've been buying so many of them. I mean, it's, it's, a, it's a long, long list. And by the way, let me know in the chat, are you guys... 
you know, focused on one one aspect of investing versus others. So are you more of a growth investor, more of a dividend investor, more of a value investor? I'd love to hear from you guys in the chat because, uh, you know, it's like 20 something of you guys. I'd love to hear from you guys if you're, you know, or if you do a full approach. Obviously, I do them all. I'm, I invest in growth stocks. I invest in values. I invest in dividend stocks. Uh, but I'd love to hear from you guys and kind of where your focus is for the most part and how you guys invest. I'm genuinely curious about that. Yeah, some people are more in the approach of like, I need to, uh, I really need to watch, you know, my money versus like worrying about, because you can kind of have two approaches. One is more worried about growing money. One is more worried about saving money, right? And not having any big, big losses and things like that. Um, someone says growth and value as dividends get more taxed in the Netherlands. Oh, interesting. I think the investor class, and so I always look at it as like classes of people getting in the stock market. I think the class, and we'll come back here to CNBC in a moment. I think the class of 2022 and 2023 are going to be actually really good investors long term. And the reason being is these folks have come into a market that was scary, a lot of they problems. Oh my gosh, stocks were falling certainly last year, this year, dividend stocks and whatnot, right? And so you came into a, pro, a market where, you know, yeah, some stocks going up, but you got a lot of stocks going down. I think it's the best market to get started in because you, you learn a little bit deeper level of like risk reward. The, the most, the worst investors I ever seen, and not to say every single person in this class was the worst, but the worst investors I ever seen was kind of the people that got in the market from basically the second half of, of 2020 through the first half of 2021. That was the worst investor class I've ever seen by far and away because that was just like up in a straight line and everybody was just like taking max, max risk and it was just like to the moon and people are just over the top and everybody's going to become a millionaire and um, you know it was a whole problematic situation so uh, that was probably like if you came into that class and you're still around and you know you got your head focused like just understand you're one of very few because that was the worst probably class of investors, probably since a tech bubble happened of like 99, just to be quite honest. Okay, let's see what's going on here. Rivian, that was enough along with the market overall to move the U.S. EV players up higher. Look at Lucid up almost 9% on the day. Remember, the EV market in terms of sales this year, while Tesla's market share is down under 60%, by the way, under 40, under 50% in the month of September, uh, here in the U.S., the, the overall sales continue to grow, Scott, now up to 7.8% of the market. Quickly take a look at the Chinese EV players. You know the story there. Uh, they've been beaten down to a certain extent out of concern about price cuts in that market. And yet, people, when they... It's crazy. I've always, you know, projected that Tesla would have a very similar market share to Apple in the U.S., which is like in the 40 to 50% range of like Apple and smartphones, right? And uh, my prediction is looking pretty freaking good. I'll say that. I'm feeling pretty darn confident about Tesla being 40 to 50% of market share of EVs sold in the United States. It's looking pretty damn good. And they're going to be a great place to be on the other side of whatever slowdown happens and to what magnitude sure. it does. And maybe some people are trying to get ahead of it now. Right. I, I do think that kind of thinking requires that you're prepared to go through that downturn, right? Whenever it does come. Unless, we've already, say, unless we've already had it and they priced, they priced it in. For recession. And on the other side of it, they're going to be able to build off these levels in the moment usually you're still going to take on some water because you don't know how bad the recession might get. But all that being said, I, I agree that that's been the case, uh, that the idea of the S&P being up, you know, at one point this year, 25 percent year to date, was not about people saying there's no recession risk because the rest of the market was suggesting Damn. that there is. And I was looking today and we talked about the banks, the consumer finance stuff, Ally Financial bumping along these really de depressed levels. Capital One, that's where I look to to say how afraid is the market of a potential downturn and it's uh, somebody in the chat asked if i'm waiting for estate earnings uh to buy it really i'm just like there's so many damn stocks that i want to buy right now like if it wasn't for the fact that there's a million other stocks i want to buy right now i would have already probably started buying estate lot over the past month or so so it's looking like it was a pretty respectable day in the public account here today it was about twenty two thousand dollar day so can't complain about that um uh, it was really helped by a lot of the smaller companies, though. Uh, you know, Meta, Tesla, such big weights in there, so it was decent, but it wasn't like anything too crazy. Now, uh, you know what is interesting? I was looking here. 
So guys, check out some of these freaking dividend stocks still got hit today. Even with, you know, treasuries being down big, even with a lot of dividend stocks having good days, some of these guys are still freaking down. Uh, Campbell's Soup was down again today. Look at this baby. I mean, it just goes down and down and down. General Mills was down again today, right? Uh, Microsoft and Apple, funny, they finished red. That's surprising. Kraft Heinz actually was red. Um, so it's interesting. And that's why I say, you, you know, you got to kind of get a few days of of momentum, activity on the upward move to really start to feel confident that like, oh, we're getting back into kind of like a bullish market. Because, you know, when some of those dogs are still being dogs, um, yeah, man. Let's see um, where AI stocks, yeah, they did decent. Let's see the Dow. I want to see the Dow stocks here today. <sighs> yeah, so today just wasn't like, it was a mixed bag when it kind of came to the large cap. It, it obviously went a little green, but it was just, it was kind of a mixed day out there. You know, Merck was down, uh, Travelers Insurance down, Microsoft down, United Health down, which United Health, I recall, if I recall correctly, they report earnings, I believe, Friday morning, uh, along with the big banks. Uh, Apple down, Amgen down, Honeywell down, Salesforce down, Johnson Johnson down, Cisco Systems down, Chevron down, IBM down today. Uh, and the best stock in the Dow 30 was actually Boeing today. Boeing could be benefiting because they do have a military side of their business. It's not just a commercial plane business. So they could be benefiting from kind of the defense spending. People thinking like, you know, with what's going on in the Middle East, what's going on in Russia, Ukraine, what could potentially happen, China, Taiwan. Um, it's kind of been a very bullish, you know, past year or so for a lot of the defense contractors. And Boeing's, you know, certainly is gets kind of grouped into a lot of those stocks. By the way, Boeing isn't even two hundred dollars a share today. I want to talk about a troubled stock the past five years. Look at Boeing, historically one of the best companies, you know, in, in the market. Boeing's down forty six percent in the past five years. My gosh, that's pretty wild, folks. Pretty wild. Three M might be worse, so let's see. Yep, three M is worse. Uh, 3M's down 54% in the past five years as a Dow stock. So my gosh, okay. All right, guys, that's going to wrap up my day here on the live stream. Uh, Wednesday should be interesting tomorrow. I think we got some good earnings after the bell. And then uh, Thursday should be interesting as well. And then it starts to get crazy, uh, obviously, next week and the following week. So I appreciate every single person that follows me here on Twitch. And I also appreciate every single person that subscribed to this Twitch. Uh, thank you for being here, guys. And uh, yeah, other than that, much love and see you tomorrow. Tomorrow. It's only a day away. Tomorrow.